All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. So without further ado, I'll get into it. And in particular, I'll start with giving a bit of introduction to what proof of stake is and the motivation of why privacy in it is interesting. Uh, so to start off with, uh, to remind ourselves what distributed ledgers are, essentially it's just a protocol which allows us to agree uh, on a sequence of blocks. And then users can occasionally append to this sequence of blocks if some conditions are satisfied. Uh, when we say proof of stake systems, really we just mean this condition depends on how much stake or uh, value you hold within a transaction system here. So proof of stake is advantageous over proof of work for multiple reasons. In particular, it is a lot less, uh, it consumes a lot less energy. It is much more environmentally friendly simply by virtue of it not requiring a huge amount of work to be done. Uh, and it's also less susceptible to external attacks. So there have been instances where proof of work currencies have been attacked by uh, mining pools from larger currencies which use the same proof of work algorithm. And this is more difficult to execute in a proof of stake setting because instead of just buying computation power wholesale, you have to actually convince participants in the protocol to give you part of it. Uh, that said, proof of stake constructions that are currently in development are have a reliance on knowing how much stake every party has for fairly obvious reasons for the most part. Uh, so we circumvent this restriction and we design a proof of stake system that works with a zero cash based transaction system and is based on Ouroboros Genesis. Uh, so our main contribution is that we do pr pr develop and prove this first uh, privacy preserving proof of stake protocol uh, I should mention at this point that there is a concurrent work by Ganesha Dal, which I believe is currently being presented to Eurocrypt, which goes across very similar lines, so it is a joint first in this regard. Uh, we model in the universal composability setting what privacy means for a proof-of-stake protocol, uh, and uh, you, you can see the full UC specification in the paper. I will give a brief uh, overview of part of the model uh, later on, but that's about all. Uh, very importantly, we also ensure that the adaptive security guarantees that uh, are in Ouroboros Genesis are preserved. I will go into a bit later why this is important, but this was really one of the major difficulties we had in the paper, and it's something I'm very glad to say we have succeeded in preserving. Uh, and in particular, in, in the process of doing so, we have uh, introduced new, uh, new SNARK-friendly authentication primitive to uh, replace forward secure signatures and we have uh, introduced key private forward secure encryption to replace the encryption in zero cache. So I need to give a little bit of background on both Ouroboros Genesis and zero cache for this to make any sense. So to start off with, with Ouroboros Genesis, uh, it divides, as Dionysus has pointed out in the last session, it divides time into large units called epochs and small units called slots. During each epoch there is some entropy eta which magically comes from somewhere. I will not go into that here. Uh, and then for every slot, if you want to create a block this slot, you evaluate a verifiable random function and you evaluate it at the point that is the slot number and the epoch uh, entropy. If this random evaluation falls under a target, then you get to create a block and what target you have depends on how much stake you have in the system. So an execution of Ouroboros Genesis may look something like this, where you see one epoch in the, uh, the non-grayed out area, and you see that various users create uh, various slots, and some slots are not, do not have any users who can create blocks in them, and some slots have multiple users where, uh, which can create blocks in them. Uh, on a separate side of the spectrum in cryptocurrencies, there's zero cash, which really doesn't concern itself with the consensus layer at all. It's just a transaction system. And it builds on the transaction system of Bitcoin and makes it more private. So where Bitcoin tracks uh, unspent transaction output, so what it does in practice is it keeps a set of coins which are unspent at any time. And then a transaction in Bitcoin is that you remove something from this set and you insert something in this set. And that's about it. Now, this is fairly simple as a construction, which is why it is also the first that has been adopted. But as previous research in transaction linkability has shown, it is very not anonymous and you can 
essentially de-anonymized transactions in it. So zero cache gets around this, and the, the way it gets around this is it takes these two set, uh, this, this set of unspent coins and it creates instead two sets which make it up. It creates a set of coins that have ever been created and a set of coins that have ever been destroyed. Now that, whoops, that by itself is not enough because, uh, well, you can still recompute the original set. So what zero cache does instead is it, instead of storing coins directly in this, these sets, it stores uh, different cryptographic properties of the coins in these sets. Uh, in particular, these are referred to as the coin commitment in the set of created coins and the coin serial number in the set of destroyed coins. Then if you want to spend a coin, you prove that it is a member of the set of created coins and you prove that it is not a member of the set of destroyed coins. You do the former by doing a Merkle tree membership proof of the coin commitment and you do the latter by simply revealing the serial number. Since it's unlinkable, uh, th this doesn't reveal anything really. Uh, and this proof is done in a zero knowledge proof in addition to proving consistency properties such as that the transaction is zero sum and that there's no value being created or lost. Uh, a brief overview of some of the cryptographic values involved. So if you have a secret key which is randomly sampled and then you can uh, derive from this the public key and together with a coin's randomness and the coin's value, you can create the coin commitments and the serial numbers. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, you only need the public key to create a commitment, so you can send other people money, but you do need the secret key to actually spend it. So what does Crypsinus do in a nutshell? Well, we run Ouroboros Genesis and Zero Cash together in tandem. And we move the uh, proof of leadership into a zero knowledge proof in Crypsinus. So in particular, this the main challenge is we need to somehow convince people that we have some stake in the system without revealing what our stake is. And we do this by doing a one-to-one -one zero cash transfer. So we simply transfer one coin into a new coin and this transfer then reveals a value uh, inside of the zero knowledge proof. And this can be then used for additional conditions and we essentially embed the Genesis leadership conditions in this. Uh, a subtle thing is that the verifiable random function can now be replaced with a pseudo random function because we get the verifiability just from the zero knowledge itself. So there are a couple of subtle problems that turn up here and the rest of the talk will really be discuss discussing these problems and what they are. Uh, briefly, a slide of how this would look compared to Ouroboros Genesis. This is a little bit disingenuous because uh, this shows that you can't see anything. If you're observing the network, you will still be able to see things. So, to, so you, if, if you have network control, then you will still be able to determine who is the leader of a specific slot. But otherwise, you still see the same structure, you see the same blocks being created and in the same sequence, but you would not see who is associated with them. So one of the first problems we encountered was that in Ouroboros Genesis, an assumption is made that uh, the stake the, the stake distribution during the course of an epoch uh, has to remain frozen. And this is, so you, so you take a snapshot at the start and then you keep using that for the remainder of the epoch. And this is done primarily to prevent grinding attacks in which you re-roll your secret keys until you get a secret key which wins in the election process. And this is obviously not ideal for proof of stake. So th this introduces a couple of problems because with the one-to-one -one zero cash transactions as part of our leadership proofs, we need to change the coins that are available. And furthermore, we, we just can't prevent users from spending. And once a user spends a coin, they reveal their serial number, which would link it to a corresponding leadership proof because it would have the same serial number in it. So what we do instead is we have uh, two sets of coins and we say that once you spend a coin, it is no longer eligible for leadership during the course of this epoch the start of the next epoch, it becomes eligible again. Uh, this, this does introduce a uh, somewhat subtle uh, concern in that it reduces the amount of total stake that is still staking during that epoch. And it, if an honest transaction is made, it also reduces the honest stake during that epoch. And we get around the issue with the one-to-one -one, uh, transfers and leadership proofs by making the newly created coin uh, deterministically derived from the old one. This means there is no input that an adversary could have here. There is no way for the adversary to control whether the new coin 
will win, and it gets around the uh, it gets around the grinding attack issue that, in that way. Uh, one thing we took a lot of care in designing is the model of our transaction system. And since we wanted to model it in UC to follow in the path of Ouroboros Genesis, uh, we first encountered the issue that zero cash does not have a UC definition. It is uh, property, uh, it has property-based security. And so f the first thing is we had to formalize what, what does this mean in the uh, simulation-based setting. The second thing is that the ledger we were trying to realize is no longer the same ledger that people typically talk about. Because in, in the standard ledger, everyone sees every transaction, whereas we want private transactions. We do not want everyone to see everything about every transaction. So we introduce a new ledger, we introduce the private ledger, and we parameterize the private ledger with a private transaction system. So one example is if you have a public ledger and you have various transactions here, so you have Alice transferring 10 units of something to Bob, then in a private ledger, different parties would see this in a different way. So Alice would see that she is transferring 10 units to someone on the ledger, and Bob would see that he is receiving 10 units from someone, but beyond that, the ledger itself doesn't reveal anything. Uh, one the core issue we had was that of uh, adaptive corruptions, and to, to briefly motivate why this is really important is that if, if I hold 20% of stake in a cryptocurrency, and I've decided, well, I'm investing into something else now, I'm gonna sell it off, then I may no longer care about the secret keys associated with it. I may no longer care that uh, if, uh, about the security that I'm using with the hardware that I stored my tokens on at some point. If I now sell my laptop on eBay and an adversary picks this up, they may at a later point in time uh, attack the system in the past where I held this amount of stake. And this is a, a major issue for a non-adaptive protocol. So the core thing that is needed for adaptive security is that once an honest party has created a leadership proof for a slot, it should be impossible to afterwards go back and change this and to make a different leadership proof or a different block. And what Ouroboros Genesis does for this is it uses forward secure signatures. This is nice, but obviously it reveals who is signing, and we can't use signatures in zero knowledge because they are, well, forward secure signatures anyway because they are too expensive. So instead we design a uh, system of Merkle tree proofs and key erasure which replaces this. Uh, so if we recall, these are the uh, cryptographic items involved in zero cash, and what we really do is we split up the secret key. And we say, we start off at a time t0 where the secret key is generated, and we randomly sample a secret key skt0. Every subsequent secret key in, the, uh, in this tree is then deterministically derived from the previous one, up until skt0 plus r, where r is some fairly large bound. We can then create a Merkle tree over this, and ensure that at any time, we only keep the keys we still need around. So at time t minus one, we'd only have skt minus one still around. As part of a leadership proof now, we would prove that we know a path in this Merkle tree to the corresponding secret key, and then we would erase it. And this would ensure that no adversary who can corrupt us at this point can create a new block with this. Uh, the final issue we had with, uh, with adaptive security was that of non-committing encryption. And this is a little bit technical as it arises essentially from uh, it being a simulation-based uh, proof that we are doing. But zero cache requires key private encryption by necessity. It uh, sends some cryptographic values to the recipient of a transaction. In particular, it sends the coin randomness row. And in a simulation-based setting with adaptive corruptions, uh, encryption needs to be non-committing. That's uh, unfortunately no way around this. While there are non-committing encryption constructions, in practice, they are not feasible. They have uh, running times that are uh, proportional to the size of the message space and usually are single use. So what instead we do is we employ key private forward secure encryption and we do a little bit of a trick. We assume first off, that messages have a maximum uh, delivery delay. So there is a maximum network delay, and every time the message is sent, it is received 
within some delay afterwards. Further off, furthermore, we assume that there is a delay in corruption. So when the adversary requests a corruption, the corruption doesn't actually go through in the real world until some time later. And what this means is we can use forward secure encryption and essentially uh, always keep our key updated to some time in the past and erase it as appropriate. So maybe more visually for these uh, green uh, messages being sent here, everything's fine by default because uh, it, the, the user receiving them is uh, honest both when they are sent and when they are received. So by the time corruption goes through, the user will have updated his secret key and will no longer be able to read them. For the messages in red, everything is also fine because at the time it is sent, uh, in the ideal world, corruption has gone through. The simulator knows the, uh, the plain text and can create a sensible cipher text correspondence. And for the message in yellow, this is where the uh, corruption delay assumption really comes in because at the time it is sent, the simulator knows nothing, but at the same time, because we assume that the adversary will not be able to read until corruption has gone through, it, we can still assume that the key is updated in time. So to summarize, we construct a privacy-preserving proof-of-stake protocol. We model it in UC and we model it with adaptive corruptions. And we also introduce the private ledger functionality and use it to construct a private currency. And I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions. No question. One question. Uh, Thomas, I really like your Merkle tree construction. Can this be used for the previous protocols uh, or reverse genesis for adaptive security or do we, or what is the difference in the assumptions if we adopted it? So I can't show it again because I think the slides have gone off. But um, so this could be used in previous protocols. It does have a slight um, downside in that if, if you paid attention, there was a upper limit to the, num well, it's a Merkle tree. There's a, a finite number of items in it and there's an upper limit to how many there are. Uh, in practice, it may not matter so much in a setting where you can use forward secure signatures anyway. Uh, and also the, this limit is not too bad in practice. So we, we've run the numbers and it, it'll work out fine. But yes, you could use this in another setting. It's maybe not as necessary though, if you're not uh, as constrained in computation powers and zero knowledge. More questions? Okay, then let's the, thank the speaker again.